Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Several, uh, Seven La Labeling Challenges Facing the Supply Chain. My name is Stacey Ajum, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Siegel Scientific. We are very excited to have you all here with us today. Um, today's speakers are Elizabeth Sinclair, and she is our Director of Marketing, and Stephen Pelletier, and he is our Marketing Manager here at Siegel Scientific. Just to let you all know, this session is being recorded and all attendees are on mute. But if you feel uncomfortable, please log off at this time. All registrants will receive access to the recording. And then if you have questions, please feel free to submit them uh, at the questions pane. And at the end of the session, we'll have uh, time for your questions. Awesome. And before we get started, we're actually going to uh, take a little poll. And so, let's go ahead and submit your answer. Um, which of these regulations and standards does your organization have to follow? Awesome. And if you haven't already, go ahead and uh, submit that in. We'll give it about a few more seconds. Awesome. So um, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And at the end of the session, we'll re reveal the results. Um, but I'm going to pass it off uh, to my teammate, Elizabeth, for an exciting overview. Thanks, Stacy. And hello, everybody. I'm really glad you can join us today. Uh, at Siegel Scientific, we, of course, develop and market software. Um, that's why you're here. But that's not really how we think of what, uh, what we do. Our real focus has always been about understanding the problems that businesses face today, anticipating their future needs, and creating solutions. Uh, almost a year ago, uh, we embarked on the research that resulted in the 40-page comprehensive guide to supply chain labeling that we're using uh, as a basis for a series of webinars. Today's presentation is the first in this series, and you'll know, uh, notice we're presenting the challenges first. We'll talk about the solutions in subsequent webinars. Um, uh, be on the lookout for the future sessions. Uh, we'll be presenting these webinars about once a month and um, topics will be things like supply chain visibility and talking about transparency, traceability, and mapping, um, the benefits of automated labeling, uh, labeling and barcode best practices for supply chain success, um, e-labeling and why it's important, uh, and four trends to watch for the future of labeling. And if you'd like to have your own copy of the comprehensive labeling guide, Look for a download link in the post-webinar email that you'll receive from us. So we're proud to be associated with our customers, the people who use Bartender to keep the world moving and safely. We're especially proud that every one of the 25 companies that the global research firm Gartner has named to their 2021 list of top supply chains is a Bartender customer. And all 25 of the companies named to Gartner's 2021 top healthcare supply chains are too. The yardstick for our success in our minds is our customer success. And so we're especially proud of that. Today's session will start with a brief discussion of each of the primary challenges we've identified, and you can see them here on the screen. And then my colleague, uh, Stephen Pelletier, who is the marketing team's top-notch technical resource, and a talented bartender virtuoso will show you ways that bartender can help you meet those challenges. So let's go. Challenge one is evolving label, uh, labeling regulations and standards. 
companies that operate in the regulated industries, sectors like aerospace, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and their trading partners have to plan around an ever-changing landscape of regulation. In the past decade, entire ERP systems have had to be reconfigured to meet new standards globally. Uh, a quick example, uh, in the US, OSHA adopted the UN's, the UN's globally harmonized system, GHS, uh, for chemical labeling a few years ago. GHS is important for worker safety, uh, using labeling to identify products, their inherent hazards, and handling pr precautions via specific written text phrases and formatting, and pictograms contained in red diamonds. So uh, remember that part. That, that's actually the big challenge here. Chemical companies owned and used all that data already. But because GHS made the phrasing for each product and warning specific and uh, prescribed strict formatting for the labeling, companies had to rearrange, rearrange master data, rethink how it was retrieved, and how labels were populated. Prior to GHS, chemical companies lived in a monochrome printing world. Uh, they, used, they used thermal transfer printers to print all their labeling. So, uh, early on, in after after OSHA decided that this was the way they were going to go with chemical labeling, I talked to a number of operations and regulatory managers um, in the chemical industry, and they said their greatest challenge in implementing GHS labeling was going to be those pictograms. Um, it was not only the problem of sourcing those pictograms into the label because data sourcing images could be challenging. And by the way, Bartender was able to do that. We helped them with that. But especially printing red diamonds because, again, the black and white thermal transfer printers. So even if your company doesn't operate in a regulated industry, there are regulations and standards you have to meet. Maybe your company works within an ISO framework or under CFR rules. Or maybe you have trading partners who require standard formatting of labeling. Maybe you're adopting GS1's new digital link standard. Regulations and standards change frequently, and companies have to be agile to meet them. Consequences of not meeting regulations and standards include hefty fines, uh, mandated shutdowns, or even permanently going out of business. And if you operate in multiple countries, you have to manage the immense variability in labeling globally. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how standards and regulations come about, because I think everyone knows about the first, but there are, there are three ways. The first is what we think of by standards and regulations is that governing bodies and regulatory agencies set them. But the second group, that set standards and regulations, I guess standards more than regulations, are industry associations. They want to get out ahead of regulatory agencies by implementing responsible member policy. Uh, members of these associations show a commitment to quality and performance by voting to adhere to these guidelines, and then regulators respect this. Um, some examples uh, in the chemical industry, it, that's NACD, the National Association of Chemical Distributors, has their responsible distribution. Um, in the food industry, there's the Produce Traceability Initiative uh, called PTI, uh, which was about a standardized industry approach to enhance speed and efficiency of traceability systems in the food industry. The third way, which is the way I find most interesting, is that um, Large retailers can require vendors to follow certain labeling rules that they establish, and then those in turn become industry standards. So, uh, for example, a few years ago, Walmart mandated a specific label for all produce coming into their warehouses based on that PTI label, which is enabled by uh, the GS1128 barcode, uh, because everyone wants to sell to Walmart, right? Uh, the label format was quickly adopted by growers and processors who now use it on all of their pallet labeling, not just the pallet labeling that's going to Walmart because it's not practical or efficient for these producers to manage multiple label formats for each customer they supply to. So you'll see what, what's now called the Walmart label um, on every pallet at Costco and Kroger and Safeway too. So, 
The ability to quickly and easily modify labeling helps companies avoid potential violations that could be costly. To manage, secure, and control label printing for a global supply chain, companies need the flexibility that simple and straightforward integration with data sources, multiple output devices, and other systems and processes provides. Our second uh, challenge that uh, our end users have told us about are labeling and barcode issues. And as you follow along today, you may notice that many of our seven supply chain challenges intersect. Okay, labeling errors can disrupt the entire supply chain. One error at an early node can cascade and multiply as a product travels from manufacture to use. This creates havoc. Errors can also lead to product recalls and supply chain inefficiencies meaning extra costs and resources dedicated to correcting and relabeling, with the potential to stall further innovation planned by the organization. Because if you're, if you're dedicating resources to fixing mistakes, you're not able to look forward. Um, it's worth noting that more than half of all US FDA food recalls are because of labeling errors. So just how expensive can a recall be? Uh, McKinsey in 2017 found that medical device companies had lost up to 600 million U.S. associated with recalls. Uh, these costs include not only those associated with implementing a recall, but also loss of brand equity and, and reputation. And many companies actually just disappear after a major recall, unable to sustain their business. So. We think of barcodes as the workhorse of the supply chain, the data carrier that's inexpensive and reliable. But so many things can go wrong if you're using the wrong labeling processes and products. Errors can include um, incorrect data. So errors with symbology, date, ingredients, uh, component, uh, other information can affect labels and lead to recall. So misplaced barcodes. If that barcode is stuck on a product or a box uh, in the wrong way on a curve, or there's not proper, uh, there aren't proper uh, quiet zones around the barcode, it might not be readable. Um, another issue is uh, color. You know, high contrast increases readability. A lot of companies are doing really clever things with barcodes. I know you've seen uh, barcodes that are that the, the bars are um, flowers growing or, or, uh, or prison cells or whatever. People are doing very creative things with barcodes, but they have to be very cautious with color. I mean, we all know that red doesn't scan and contrast is important to readability. Uh, the, another issue is poor print quality. Barcodes can't scan if black and white aren't properly spaced or there's blurring or blotched ink spots. And then um, degraded media, label, labels that are covered, peeling, torn, or folded may be rendered unreadable. A well-deployed labeling system is going to provide accuracy, reliability, and security by managing printing directly with output devices. That's printers, RFID encoders, uh, marking devices, and also integrating with verification hardware. And by connecting with directly with the WMS and ERP systems to source data, companies can avoid data duplication um, and also streamline the process of label creation, better enabling product traceability. Our next challenge that our customers have told us about is the challenge of supporting multiple languages. If you operate in multiple countries, you'll need to create labels in different languages and sometimes even different dialects. And if you sell that same product into multiple markets with different languages, you're going to need to have a different label for each language. This has the potential to exponentially increase the resources you need to dedicate to your data management. Think about our global economy and think about your company's growth. By being able to efficiently manage multiple languages in your labeling, you broaden your ability to expand to new markets and new customers. But if you can't manage multiple languages, you lose business opportunity. 
Um, let's also think back to our first challenge, uh, meeting regulatory compliance. Every geography has its own set of labeling standards and regulations, and each is managed in local languages. Software that can enable a single file to hold multiple languages, and that's file, by the way, that's not label. We're not printing the label uh, with five different languages to go to five different countries. We're managing variable data in one label file to automatically print a label in the language that it needs to be. Um, being able to do this drastically reduces a company's resources dedicated to file and data management. So it's about labeling hygiene. And a bartender, um, actually many of you might not know, includes auto translation libraries um, and support for every modern writing system. We believe these are differentiators for companies making incursions into profitable new markets. So this is, um, this is a sore spot for me, and we hear this a lot from our customers about labeling uh, processes that aren't centralized, that are fragmented. Uh, labeling has to be responsive. Uh, you have to be able to efficiently accommodate stakeholders and things like changes in regulation, scaling or downsizing, mergers, economic fluctuations, new markets or products, expansion and rebranding uh, uh, can really impact the, the ability uh, for a company to function properly. The good news is that good labeling processes can, can enable that. Um, when labeling processes are siloed though, supply chain visibility is limited and redundancies and inefficiencies are common. We often see companies that are growing through merger and acquisition activities struggle with this problem as new companies are folded in and come online. Each organization not only has its own labeling system, ERP, and data sources, but also their own processes for managing labeling. This leads to inefficiencies. Uh, one of our customers that had grown through M&A saw a proliferation of label files. Not only were their processes disparate and complex to begin with, but they exacerbated the problem by sharing label files, by emailing them from one new company to, from the existing company to the, a new company and then back again. Uh, they had labels uh, living on hard drives, in email clients, on servers, on SharePoints. So an efficient and compliant supply chain requires labels that are auditable and traceable from a central repository. There was no way this company could track who printed or modified a label. And what if an employee left the company? A label might be lost forever on a hard drive or disk somewhere. And uh, the company had redundant labels. Many of the products they manufactured were identical but sold under different brand names. They had set up their labeling system to manage a different label file for every SKU. So eventually, Bart, the, the company settled on Bartender for their global operation, um, and they've started managing label access securely uh, from one central location. Their labeling is agile, responsive to business needs. Because it's centrally managed, changes to a label be, can be cascaded out immediately through the entire organization by uh, a simple change to the master data, or a change to the, the label file itself. Um, they now manage variable label data using our intelligent templates, so they were able to merge redundant label files. They use Bartender to harmonize their systems, centralize label management, and control user access. And um, the end result here is this company was able to reduce the over 9,000 labels they managed, that's one for each SKU, down to only 24 label files. So uh, consumer requirements. Our customers are different today. They care about where the things they buy come from, what's in them, and how they've been handled. They're actually demanding visibility into the supply chain. Uh, with, over the past 18 months, Online shopping has accelerated to an unexpected and stratospheric rate. Customers have shifted brand loyalty. They choose what's available now over what they're accustomed to. 
and they expect to be able to order and receive items the same day, if not within the hour. And you talk about stresses to the supply chain. Uh, let's compound this by the fact that we carry smartphones in our pockets with about 7 million times the processing power that it took NASA to send humans to the moon in, 19, in the 1970s. We expect to be able to use these devices to find stuff out, like ingredient information, provenance, allergen data, proper storage and handling, recipes. Uh, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and there might be a grain of truth in saying that here, we want to know the name of the chicken we're being served for dinner. Uh, so the real challenge here lies in the fact that we, consumers, want to know specific information about each product and at the item level. We're rapidly reaching the point where every item in the supply chain will need its own unique item level identifier. And this will do more than actually meet consumer demands. It opens up whole new vistas in supply chain transparency, like uh, digital twins, for example. New standards like GH1, GHS's, sorry, GS1's digital link are addressing this new way of thinking about product information. And customers also care about the environment. They want to know how to correctly dispose of items when they're done. Uh, there's one global fast fashion company that you've heard of. Um, they include upcycling and recycling information on their product label, uh, those sewn-in labels um, on, the, on the garment, so that consumers know exactly what to do with their clothes when they wear out or they're tired of them. Uh, the right labeling software is future forward. It can manage the large amount of data required for the new age of unique item identification and has the standards required to meet consumer demands like digital link built in. So labeling makes the world go around, uh, makes my world go around, uh, or at least, at least keeps the supply chain running. But every industry has different standards and ways to use labeling that require in-depth understanding of how to appropriately meet labeling regulations. Even if you're using good labeling software, if it's not regularly updated with correct industry information and formatting or kept uh, ahead of changes of regulatory standards you have to meet, you're going to find it challenging to remain on top of your industry requirements. Good labeling software understands regulations and business requirements and applies business logic to your print job so you don't have to think about it. Well, at least not too often. Labeling should offer global change management, centralized configurable role-based access, built-in audit trail capture and e-signatures for 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, automated compliance with standards like GS1, and sample industry templates that you can use as your starting point for creating your labeling. And then our seventh challenge is global expansion. And again, you'll find that many of these topics are, are quite interwoven. So we've talked about languages and geography-specific regulatory requirements. Let's think, though, for a minute about discrete manufacturing, industries like medical devices, aerospace, or automotive companies. First and second tier suppliers to these organizations can be located around the world. Standardizing processes becomes essential to efficient, efficient business operations. Uh, one of our customers, one of the big five auto manufacturers, um, the problem they, we solved for them or that they told us about, they were receiving manufacturing components from first and second tier suppliers across the globe. But the labeling on these components was inconsistent. It was so inconsistent that product had to be checked and often relabeled before reaching the manufacturing floor. And um, the automotive industry has stringent standards for labeling and tracking parts. So it's essential that the identifiers on the labeling are, is con are consistent throughout a component stack, right? The standards weren't being met and neither were the company's standard internal processes. It was costing them a lot of time and money, 
having to touch every item to inspect and correct labeling as it came into their facility. Their eventual solution uh, was to mandate its first and second tier suppliers use bartender and pre-approved formats to print all their labels. Hooray, that was a happy day for us. Um, to efficiently scale and grow into new markets, companies should standardize on enterprise labeling software, enabling labeling systems to easily integrate across the supply chain. With the right enterprise labeling software, a WMS can seamlessly integrate labeling across the globe, even automatically serializing between multiple production facilities on different continents. As products are transported and packaged, labeling isn't compromised or duplicated, and you have a lean, efficient supply chain. So, I've just outlined what our company hears from our customers, the most significant labeling challenges that they face today. And I've hinted at a few software-based process solutions. And now I'm happy to introduce my talented colleague, Stephen Pelletier. Uh, Stephen's going to show us how Bartender helps real-world companies meet these challenges and exceed expectations. Stephen, take it away. Awesome. And actually, before Stephen uh, goes into his uh, demo, we're going to actually launch another poll. And so, awesome. Uh, when you have a chance, go ahead and submit uh, your response to the question, how much lead time does your organization need to deploy new labels into production? All right, and we'll give um, just a few more seconds. So go ahead and submit those, um, submit your responses. Awesome. Okay. All right. So at the end uh, or towards the end of the session, we're going to reveal um, the responses to the poll, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Stephen. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, let's make sure everybody can see my screen. Just a moment. Here we go. All right. So, uh, my name is Stephen Pelletier. I'm going to be showing you some of the ways that Bartender can help you with these challenges that we've discussed. Not so much a deep dive into processes or design or anything like that, but just kind of touchstoning and stepstoning all through uh, the features a Bartender has that helps you address these challenges. The first one is those evolving labeling standards. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth had spoken about the PTI voice pick code. This is that label. This is the Walmart label. Uh, and the, what I always like to say is the only thing better than having a complex label is a complex label that someone else already did some work on for you. And that's what we have here. This is a label that's included with Bartender. So when you download the software, you install the software, this label is going to be here for you, just out of the box, ready for modifications, ready to accept your data. Uh, we've got everything labeled out here in terms of city state, date description, grade info, and, and the like. Uh, your voice pick down here. Uh, you can see that there's a significant amount of VB script that makes this work. Uh, change that. There we go. Take a look at the script editor and see kind of what's under the hood here. So we've got some VB script here that's going to be putting those numbers together, and we'll show you what that does here in a second. The reason this is important is because if something were to change again, let's say uh, this GS1 barcode here, let's say they wanted to add an AI code to it. Well, one of the things that Bartender is going to let you do is use our GS1 application identifier data source wizard, which is a mouthful, and I've had a lot of practice, so don't don't try to don't try that at home. Uh, what this does is it allows you to simply and easily walk through the creation generation of what used to be a very complex process 
uh, of putting together this GS1 standard barcode. So if we move these things out of the way, let me just uh, get this here. So we can use this as a reference. Let's say they wanted to add an identifier to this standard. We're gonna start with 01, right? AI01, which is your G10, right? So we're just gonna go ahead and say, yep, we need that still. We're gonna move on. We're just gonna use embedded data. And I do want another one. We're also gonna include 13, right? So 13 is a packaging date, which is uh, some other information we have down here. We're gonna leave it as a clock. We want another one. This is where they made the change though, right? So they, they don't want just the pack date, they want a best before date as well. So we can insert this leave that as a clock data source, and then finish up with number 10, which of course is our batch or lot number. We'll use some embedded data for that. And what that's done is it's automatically adjusted this barcode to include all of the other data in addition to new data. Now, it used to be you had to build these things from scratch and it was not a fun process, um, and that's why when we heard people say, hey, we, we need this, we wanna be able to do this quickly and easily, so we built that data wizard into our software. As you can see, the voice pick information has changed. We can even uh, go here. We need a best before date. It's not today, it's actually going to be an offset. So we're gonna set a transform to it. Let's say a constant transform. And we're gonna say that it's three, so three weeks from today is this date here. So it'd be August 19th, 2021. So that was a process that might've taken days possibly for somebody to figure out. We just did it in seconds. Uh, another example of this right out of the box, of things that are changing, things that have uh, come up in the last few years is the, the Hibic UDI. So medical device manufacturers are very well versed in this one. Uh, I had the privilege of being with Siegel Scientific as this was up and coming and watching it being implemented in our software to make it easy for our customers as this was coming up uh, from just a concept to providing our customers with the necessary VB script and tutorials to now we have it just as a, an out of the box option in our software. Uh, the next thing that we, we have we have people with challenges is the, the labeling and barcode issues, right? And uh, anybody on the line who's ever had to validate a barcode or validate a label knows what I'm talking about. And oftentimes what I find is that they are, they tend to be physical issues with the printing of the barcode. And, and my colleague had mentioned before that, you know, contrast is a big deal making sure that your barcode is clear and crisp and can be read easily by this the, main, the uh, equipment that you're using to scan it and if it doesn't validate correctly oftentimes it's because the scanner recognizes that it's not as clear or crisp as it should be what's great about bartender is that we give you the ability to make those changes on a per printer or per label basis so for example if you've got a new printer right? Everything was fine before and now you have a new printer, but it doesn't validate correctly. Uh, what you can do is you can go into your document properties here from the print dialog, go to your options and say, well, we've got a couple of things that we can, we can play with a little bit. Oftentimes it can come down to speed. So you might want to well, maybe just slow this down by half, half an inch per second uh, to see if that helps. Maybe there's a limitation in the new printer where it, it doesn't handle this particular barcode or this particular label as well at a higher speed, or we can also adjust the print temperature, right? So you thermal transfer printing, right? So you've got your, your label media, and then you have your, uh, your ribbon, which is usually a resin or a wax, which has to be heated up and then transferred onto the label. So if it's too hot, it can melt too much of that material and make it blotchy and it'll spread and it won't validate correctly. If it's not hot enough, 
it can uh, leave bare spots, it might not be dark enough, the contrast may not be correct. And so very quickly and easily, you can come into these settings right here within Bartender while you're working on the label and testing this out with your new hardware or what have you, and make sure that this is gonna come out the right way every single time. Uh, the third challenge is supporting multiple languages is one of my favorites uh, because it, it helps us get into new spaces, right? So we wanna get into a new market. Um, we have this fictional product, our Thanksgiving jam. Don't knock it till you try it. You have to experience it to really understand what it's all about. Uh, but this, somebody made, a, somebody made a TikTok and now it's gone viral and I have people trying to order this product in different countries around the world. Unfortunately, their labeling processes require that I have this label presented in the languages of those regions. And so we have our data builder product that allows us to use a, what's called a phrase library. And so we have a database here with in, includes the, the word ingredients, the name of the product, and the ingredients list itself. And so it's to get those languages into my label, it is just as easy as adding a language. Let's say we're gonna use Spanish and French and German, I'm gonna say okay. And now we have additional columns here in our database for these languages, Spanish, French, and German. Okay, so ordinarily, the old process would be, I gotta copy this out to Google Translate, make sure that nothing got messed up, and then come back in here and paste it. But that's the old way. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna go ahead and auto-translate this entire database into these three additional languages and start shipping this product to those regions right now going to go ahead and say we're going to select all of our languages say okay translate and we now have a database full of the data that we need in the languages that we need so that we can start to ship that product but how do we get this into the label well let's go ahead and save this first and in our label we can go to our libraries over here on the side connect to an existing library. We're gonna browse, we have our jam library here. And now we have phrase library one, it includes all of those languages that we had. But these objects were created with embedded data only because I didn't expect that these changes were gonna to have to be made so quickly. So we're gonna go ahead and change this data source type from embedded data to include the library phrase. Okay, so we have phrase library one. I'm going to change the phrase ID to 002, which is our title name. And without even closing the text properties, we're going to move right on to the next item to speed things up. And we're going to do it again and choose 003. And then one more for the list of ingredients. Library phrase, there we go. And now each one of these, you'll notice here, is a library phrase. If we go back through, library phrase, library phrase. You say, well, okay, well, that's cool, but they're still in English. How are we gonna print these in the languages that we want them to be? So uh, we're gonna go ahead and back in here, we're gonna configure the languages to select at print time. This is a manual selection at print time. This can be data source, this can be automated. This is just gonna to be to demonstrate how this works. Okay, so we close that. We're gonna use our form because the, the data entry form is what pops up at print time and displays options to our print operators. And we're gonna use a drop down list here on our form. Just gonna center it up nice and neat. Uh, ordinarily, I'd make this probably look a little more brand centric, but for the purposes of this exercise, we're just gonna go into the options here, the properties, find our linked data source, and you'll see that the language is now a data source. And we're gonna go ahead and just link the language data source to the drop down menu. Come back over to our template. And if we were to preview this, you'll notice our data entry form pops up and we have a select a value. And there are our languages. Let's go ahead and pick German. And there it is. We have our German label. Easy peasy. 
the work's almost done for you. Uh, one more thing that you can do uh, if you're working uh, internationally and people have uh, different languages that they need to work in, if very easily, very quickly, you can go into your user preferences and actually change all of Bartender over to uh, the language of your choice. So we can actually, going, going back to German, say OK. And now everything in Bartender is in German. And I don't speak German, so we're just going to go ahead and put that back to Windows Standard English. There we go. Now, challenge number four, uh, the fragmented labeling process. This one gets a lot of people. Uh, and it's, it's not entirely anyone's fault necessarily. What happens is that people are focused on what it is that they're doing. They're part of the process. And somehow, uh, again, not necessarily anybody's fault, but the, the 10,000 foot view of the labeling process kind of is foregone. Like you, you don't have an overview. You have people, you know, kind of focused on their individual pieces in this process, whatever it happens to be. Now, thankfully, to the rescue comes librarian. Uh, librarian is is a is two things. It is a label repository, which is what we're going to be talking about here, and then it is also a revision control system. We'll be talking about in a little bit as it as it relates to a different challenge. Uh, you know, if you'll remember previously in the presentation, uh, we talked about uh, one of our customers had over nine thousand labels, and they were able to get it down to twenty four labels. And you, I wouldn't blame anybody here for raising an eyebrow and saying, okay, uh, well, how exactly is that even possible? Is such a thing even possible? Yes, it is. Um, librarian works off of uh, our bartender system database, which means that your labels and every revision thereof is stored in a database as opposed to in a file structure. And that's a very out of the box type of concept for a lot of people. Uh, it behaves just like uh, you know, your file structure, I mean, you can, if you're in Bartender, and let's say I wanted to save my newly uh, updated Thanksgiving Jam label, I can save this in Librarian. It shows up right here, right alongside my desktop PC network. It is a Librarian file location uh, inside Bartender, and you can see the address right up here. It, this is going to save this label in in librarian now I already have a copy of this in librarian you can see the you know it might be a little small but you can see it's not quite finished yet um, but we're going to go ahead and save this here and look at what happens this already exists if we continue with the save we're going to create a new revision of this file that's very important you're going to continue with the save yeah yeah, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and save it, and we're going to check in. And that's, that's a really important part of this, is checking it in. Um, requires checking out from the librarian. You want to continue? Yes. And then there's this pro part of the process. We're checking in the file. We want to make a comment. What did we change? How did we make a change to this? This new revision is different from the old revisions, and so we need to say what it is that we did to it when we save it in this central location. Uh, so we're going to say that we added languages using the phrase library. It's a little sparse, but for the purposes of the demonstration, I think we're okay. We're going to have to go ahead and check it in. And there it is. Notice how its little lock icon came up. This means that this is currently checked into Librarian. Somebody put this into Librarian, and the copy of this label that lives in Librarian is currently in there, and it hasn't been. it's not being edited by anybody right now. If we want to make changes to it, we can check it out. You know, just like you would a book from the library, right? So when you want to make changes to it, it gets checked out. What this is going to do is it's going to prevent multiple copies of your labels sitting out there in your file structure, in your emails, in your messaging applications, where you've got it living in one place. And you're not going to have a bunch of people working on the same thing all at once. I just had a conversation uh, 
with a, an employee of a, a very large company who is currently struggling with a revision control process uh, where they ran into a situation where for weeks on end, two different teams were working on what seemed to be this same exact or parts of the same exact process. And that wasted a lot of time. It wasted a lot of money. It means that those not only did they double up on their efforts, but they also could have been doing something else. So it's it's double or triple the loss when you really kind of spread it all out and, and you know, when it comes out in the wash. It's, you know, teams doing the same exact thing when they didn't need to be. What could have been if we didn't have that situation? The same thing goes here. Instead of having copies and copies and copies of labels living in people's folders, uh, in their email and in their messaging apps or what have you, they live in one place. They live in librarian right here, right? And, and what this is going to do is it's going to give people access to the, all of the labels in their single form. They can make changes to the labels. You know exactly what's happened, right? And you can see here, you know, we had the original note I, when I checked it in the first time, just jam, right? We're making jam. However, when I checked it in here, we now have notes that says what happened. At what stage of the process is this? Who did what? What was it exactly that they changed? And we can follow this down. So if there is a breakdown, if something does happen, and we have to figure out where something broke down, we can use this log in the comments in the file history to understand where the breakdown was. And we can actually go back to that revision and, and make changes to it again. So why don't I double click on this? This is going to open up the revision one. So if something that I did in revision two necess didn't necessarily uh, jive with you know the the end the end result that we wanted, we can come back to this and start from this point moving forward. So you're not losing your work. Um, that's that is going to to make a huge impact on that fragmented labeling process. Now, challenge number five, customer requirements. Um, it's always in flux. Always, always, always. If we come back over to Bartender here, one of my favorite examples, we see it every day, is the Nutrition Facts label. And obviously, this is, this is the new Nutrition Facts label. Um, if we take a look at this image here that I pulled from uh, the FDA's website, this is what it used to look like. Uh, I think it was around... 2016, I think. Uh, don't don't hate me if I got that wrong. Um, but we we had to make changes, right? We had to make things a little easier to understand. You know, big big text for the number of calories, huge change, right? Um, changes to the serving size, visibility, right? Because this is what consumers wanted. They wanted easier to understand nutrition labels. Uh, and so again, you know, right out of the box, we have this. This is a nutrition facts label that is included with Bartender. When you install the software, this comes as part of it. And we've already gone that first mile for you. So this is ready to accept your data. You can just pull this up, attach it to your database, plug in your values, whatever you need, and it's ready to go. And it's just another way that Bartender helps you meet those customer requirements. When these changes happen, we're on it. We do our best to get these done as quickly as possible. Uh, another one is this guy. If you ever ordered anything from Amazon, you've probably seen a label that looks an awful lot like this. Uh, the, the transparency initiative uh, from Amazon is there so that when you want to know where your stuff was made, when it was made, uh, you know where it came from, that's the goal of this label. And again, this is another label that comes with Bartender out of the box. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to put on Amazon. This is more than likely going to be one of your best friends. Um, but it, again, it just kind of ties back to what people want. The, the customer, the people who are paying money for a product want additional information. And these are two examples of how those uh, those those needs change, right? People want more information, and when we want to give it to them, labeling is, is one of the best ways to communicate that information. 
The next one is industry-specific nuances. Um, somebody has to know what these regulations are, what these labeling requirements are. And sometimes the person who's designing the label isn't necessarily going to be the person who has all of that information. They receive a spec sheet that says, here, we need this in these places. We need this barcode here. This text needs to be this big. This is the information that needs to be shown. But perhaps they don't have the all of that information, right? Maybe they don't have they don't have the bandwidth to both make the labels and be on top of all of these label regulations. Uh, it is possible. So uh, for this, we're actually going to go back to librarian, but we're going to do it a little differently. We're going to go through our administration console, and we're going to take a look at our visual workflows. Uh, the, the workflows, we're going to take a look at an approval workflow, are just that. So it, it affords you the ability to create the label, you design the label, you can submit it for review. During the review process, it can either be reproved or rejected, and then it can go into production. And this ties back into what we we're talking about, checking in and out of Librarian, right? So the, the designer may pull it out of Librarian, check it out, say, I'm going to be working on uh, you know, these, these points in, in the regulatory process, and then they submit it for review. When they submit it for review, you can even send a notification that tells somebody who needs to, look to review this, hey, this is ready for review, take a look at it. And maybe the person doing the reviewing is that person who has that, that industry-specific knowledge about what is, what is going to make or break this label. Could be an internal uh, component, could be uh, a contractor or you know, a consultant, but whoever it is, you've got another layer at that point to say yes or no whether or not this is correct. Um, you know, if you miss something on your label, it can lead to a recall. Uh, recently, earlier this year, I was reading an unfortunate situation in an article. Uh, this particular company had missed one piece of information, just one, and dozens of tons of their product had to be recalled. I, I shudder to think of what that was going to cost them. Um, and if we take a look at the setup here, you can just put whatever you want, send it to whoever you want, and you know they'll receive that notification. Uh, we've actually done a lot of that work for you here. So in the review process, following files are waiting for review and approval. And we have, if you'll notice, we've got some uh, values here that are surrounded by percent signs. Now, anywhere you see these in the bartender software, this is a variable. So you can set up the, the two line in this email to a variable that is the approval members. You can set up the approval members, whoever those happen to be, and it will send the email to them. The file name is the name of the label file that's being worked on. So you don't even have to type this up. Uh, the comment, obviously, is that comment that we, we left you know, saying what we changed in that label design process as we checked it back in. Uh, and so this, this is another way that Bartender is going to save you time in addition to helping you secure the proper label design so that you are, in fact, adhering to those regulations and standards and you don't have to worry about redoing your work. You don't have to worry about uh, you know, the dreaded recalls right? because you, you forgot something or something was in the wrong place or there was an issue with the label in general. Um, and these, of course, are these are customizable. You know, we can we can add to them, we can move them around. Uh, if we needed, you know, an, another state, we can put another state in here somewhere, and we can say that we need a transition from here over here. And, you know, maybe this is, uh, you know, maybe we'll call this. Uh, So when it's approved, not only is it approved, but leadership is notified as well, and we can we can set a, a notification in there. Again, all of this we've already kind of gone the first mile. 
for you. You know, this is this is a template that we've worked out. This is a way to get started quickly and easily. It's ready for your modifications. It's just waiting for you to enter your information, enter your variables, and get ready to go. And the last challenge, of course, is going to be global expansion. I don't think anyone who has ever expanded on a global scale has said that it was easy. It's definitely wrought with challenges. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of things that have to be done and done correctly. And that's the key here that we're going to be talking about uh, with Integration Builder. Uh, one of the things you don't want to have to worry about once you get to a point where you're expanding into new markets and across the globe is human error, right? We love people individually on the whole. People make mistakes. Uh, and that's why automation is so important. So again, one of the things that Bartender does for you is we set up a series of examples for these integrations. The integration builder allows you to trigger the printing of a label based on a triggering event. And that can be anything from uh, you know, using a, a data file right, a, uh, or a database, which is what we're going to be looking at here. Uh, but we have a number of examples that have already been built, again, to take you that first mile. Uh, we'll take a look at the database integration here. So in the example that we have with our Thanksgiving Jam, let's say uh, you know, we, we've done well you know, quarter over quarter. We're, we're growing at an exponential rate. And now it, it, we, we, we've outgrown the need for print operators. We need this to happen. As the orders come in, these labels need to print and ship without anybody actually touching them. And that's what this can do. This is a great way to get started. Uh, and, and it looks like a lot, but the great thing about Integration Builder is that it's broken down into sections. So it, basically everything happens from top to bottom. You can get fancy and you know use some logic and things like that, but in general, it works top to bottom. So we have our, our integration. The integration is going to start automatically record detection. What this is doing is it's using a data, the insertion of a database record uh, with an increasing value to trigger that label printing event. And we can take a look at the database here. We can see that this is the database it's connected to. If we look at, the, at our, our, our records, we can see that we have our company names in here uh, for people who want to ostensibly buy the jam. Uh, when a new record is detected, it will have an increased value in that, in that record, in the, the ID field. Uh, when it detects that new value, um, it's going to execute actions. And so the actions we have is that for each database record that it detects with a value that is increased, we are going to use the event data. Event data is just going to be the contents of that row in the database to then print the document. Okay? And that document is going to print every time a new record comes in with a new value. No human being is going to necessarily interact with it. Obviously, we have to rely on people entering data into the database. You know, whatever process is, is letting that happen. Um, but you no longer have print operators to worry about in terms of making a, an, a manually printed mistake. Uh, no more data entry forms necessarily, although that is an option in here. Integration Builder basically allows you to automate just about anything you want when it comes to not only the bartender suite, but we also have the ability to in, in implement PowerShell. So if you can do it in Windows even, uh, Integration Builder most likely has an option to allow you to automate that process. So fewer errors, faster printing, and we've done, again, sort of this first mile work for you so that you can take this example and build on it, insert your, your data connect to your database, modify it to your heart's content, make it do what you need it to do to meet your requirements. And so that uh, takes us to our, our last, uh, through our last challenge. And uh, I hope this was informative. Uh, and again, as, as I said earlier in the presentation, not so much a deep dive into design and implementation, but just sort of an overview and stepping through the features that Bartender offers you to meet these challenges and overcome them. Because anybody in, this, in, in, you know, in the business of labeling, if you have to label something, you're going to run into one of these challenges. And Bartender is more than likely going to be the thing that gets you through it.
All right, so the first poll we had, here are the results. Yeah, majority um, of folks have to use um, either FDA uh, 21 CFR 11, UDI, or EU MDR. Um, and then following that is GS1 Digital Link. And then the next was how much lead time does your organization need to deploy new labels into production? And majority of y'all at 39% said one to two weeks, which is very exciting. Um, and we did have some folks uh, come in saying that it takes them greater uh, or more than six weeks. Um, but the second uh, largest amount after one to two weeks was uh, one week at about a quarter of y'all saying that it takes you one week. Awesome. Well, we did have a couple of questions come in um, that we can cover. Uh, we were asked if we had a, a library of label templates and formats approved by retailers, governing bodies, like, and that came in just before Stephen started uh, demoing the Walmart label. And yes, there is a robust list of sample templates included in Bartender uh, for every industry. We also had a question about um, any resources rec uh, regarding encoding data matrix uh, using ISO IEC 15434 syntax. And that's, uh, that's actually the MIL standard 130 requirement. Um, and yes, Bartender includes a sample template for, for that MIL spec. Check out our support site at uh, support.segalscientific.com for more in info. Just do a search on that term. Um, and several of our partners actually do uh, specialize in integrations for DOD. And uh, there are several YouTube videos that are um, out there that you can uh, dial up and take a look at. Um, there was a question about VDA, uh, which is a, a German regulation. Uh, German automotive regulation, does bartender uh, manage compliance for that? And yes, the answer is we've helped many auto manufacturers with BDA compliance. Uh, let's see another question. Um, yes, in our library, do we already have symbols for things like vegan, no animal testing, no parabens, no sulfates? Yes, and these are generally handled um, in bartender as fonts. There are a number of different font sets uh, that you can find in Bartender that can help uh, with these symbols. You know, things like uh, the CE logo. And are printer settings able to be saved to a format so the system knows how to set a given printer model at runtime? And the answer is yes, that's one of the things that we do best. So Stacy, um, I think it's time to wrap up this discussion please look for the recorded version um, in your email. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. Stacy. anything we need to do to finish up here? No, that's about it. And if we uh, didn't get to your question on the air, no worries. Uh, we'll follow up with you personally via email as well. Thanks everyone for attending. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day.